want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Hosea, chapter 11, if you have your smartphones, and, uh, uh, and we can read it from the screen in just a moment. But community Bible reading got off to a great start this past week, and we're reading through the prophets. And last week we read uh, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, and the first part of Isaiah. And this week we'll read together and pick up back with Isaiah tomorrow. I want you to consider getting into a focus group, not just because we want numbers there, not because we uh, are trying to build small groups. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with discovering God's word together as a family, digging it out, going deeper in it, knowing it because it will hold you when hell breaks loose. It'll hold you, it'll hold you in. And so, the reading schedule for this week will be posted online, the Westmore Facebook page, or you can pick it up in the lobby or the focus group tonight, but it's not too late to get started. If you haven't, you can just read a little extra each day, or you can catch up on a weekend because we give weekend breaks, so I want you to consider it. And like last year during community Bible reading, I took a rock, skipped it across the water, so to speak and we would hit some highlights uh, from the previous week of what you had read. And today I wanna hit some highlights from the book of Hosea. The prophets often use symbols to communicate the message of God and, and Hosea is no different. But what make, makes Hosea unique is his marriage is brought into the prophetic. Hosea's marriage the unique trait about this book is that his own marriage was taken into a prophetic mission. And therefore, Hosea's prophecy had a lifelong calling. And here's the thing, you can't read and understand Hosea without seeing ourselves. It's an amazing book about God's amazing grace and how far he'll go. And it's real, it's very raw. In fact, if you get concerned about anybody watching a movie on the PG level, you might want to cover their ears today because it's the Word of God. And we fail. Oh, how we fail. But God's grace can find us no matter what we've done. Do you believe that today? We want to talk about this. Let's read this together. When Israel was only a child, I loved him. I called out my son, called him out of Egypt. But when others called him, he ran off and left me. He worshiped the popular sex gods. He played at religion, had toy gods. Still, I stuck with him. I led Ephraim. I rescued him from human bondage, but he never acknowledged my help. He would never admit that I was the one pulling his wagon that I lifted him like a baby to my cheek. I bent down to feed him. Now he wants to go back to Egypt or go over to Assyria anything but return to me. That's why his cities are unsafe. The murder rate skyrockets and every plan to improve things fails to pieces. My people are hell bent on leaving me. They pray to God bail for help. He doesn't lift a finger to help them. But how can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I turn you loose, Israel? How can I leave you to be ruined like Adma? devastated like luckless Zebon. I can't bear to even think such thoughts. My insides churn in protest. And so I'm not going to act on my anger. I'm not going to destroy Ephraim. And why? Because I am God and not a human. I'm the Holy One and I'm here in your very midst. You can't get away from God's love. You can't do it. You can't do it. 
And I'm so thankful for that because I'm a product of that. And I stand here today because of the grace of God. And if you don't realize it, I'll say to you dead in the eye, so do you. You're only here because of the grace and mercy of an almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the way that it speaks to us, reminds us of things that we need to be aware of. And if there's one today that needs to accept that love and needs to stop running, I pray that you'd make yourself known to them in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. There's such an anointing here, wow. This is a story about a man who had a passionate, unwavering love for his beautiful young wife. And several years later, after bearing three children, she suddenly decided that she was going to leave him and the three children. And to make matters worse, she decides to make a living by selling her body for income. And for many years, the she prostitutes herself and shares her body with anyone that would pay the price. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It even gets more bizarre after many years with her beauty fading. Years later, as you journey through the book of Hosea, years later, we find her uh, beauty fading. And there's no real way to profit for herself anymore and the profiteers decide to put her on the auction block and who would show up in the auction or at the auction and outbid everyone but a husband named Hosea and he buys her back the husband who had by now raised his children still single he had to admit that in spite of all of her fading beauty and all of the shame that she had brought to him and all of the disgrace, and all of her ridiculous, stupid decisions, that he still loved her. He loved her with a love that's hard to understand. And in this story, this husband, still single, loves her. Why? I, I asked myself the question this week, and earlier in the week, and we even talked about it humorously in our creative preaching group. We, Pastor Jared and Brother Chris Sheelick and Zach and several of the guys and then Vera, we all sit around and we talked about this passage for a few moments and I asked the question, how would you rate this? If you had to put a movie rating on it and it was really raw and real as the story is presented. Hollywood ought to love movies like this, but makes a living doing that kind of thing, but would you rate it R? How graphic would you get with it? But it, would it be restricted R or MA for a mature audiences only? Would you rate it PG for parental guidance? This story is in the Bible. This story is in the Bible. We uh, don't feel real comfortable with that. It doesn't always fit the way we were taught that everything's supposed to be okay and people get saved a certain way and people find God a certain way. And grace, what really is that? Because when we go to our church meetings, grace gets pretty limited sometimes. I'm just saying, how does this kind of story find its way in the Bible? Well, the same way God called murderers and thieves and prostitutes and Puts them in the lineage of Jesus, for Pete's sake. So it gets bizarre. Gomer, the wife of Hosea. We have words in our culture for people like her. And I want to be honest with you. Prostitute. Slut. Hooker. Whore. The high dollar ones we call escorts. We, we learned to put a band-aid over that a little bit, but some of you are really nervous right now. That's who this woman was. 
I want you to understand it. I want you to understand the impact on Hosea. I want you to understand what he must have felt when he went to bed at night and had to lay his head down after putting his children to bed and she's not there. She's out laying with another man. I want you to understand the rawness and realness of this. I want you to understand the love that it would take to help somebody like that that had done you so wrong. I want you to get your arms around that. Put his sandals on for a moment. What would you do? How would you feel? Justice says punish them. We all like to talk about justice, don't we? It's the cultural hot button right now. Oh, we want justice. Justice would say punish them, punish her. Logic would say punish her. Love says forgive her. Grace says take her back. Take her back at all cost. Go as high as you've got to go or as low as you've got to go. Grace says, take her back. So we walk around acting like we have love and we have grace. Do we have that kind of love? Do we have that kind of grace when we come to church and we do our spiritual calisthenics every week and leave feeling better about ourselves, but then we go through tough times and yet we can't learn. We just don't know how to let somebody off the hook who does this kind of stuff. We don't know how to walk away from that and say, oh God, they're in your hands. Would you save them? Would you somehow find them as bad as they've been or as how far as they've gotten out there? Could you find a way to save them? We can't even pray that way for somebody who does this kind of thing. This isn't easy. Hosea, put his sandals on. I hope you did that while you read this this week. Because this is the real story. This isn't the rest of the story. This is the real story. This is what the Bible is talking about. This is what God is trying to get across to all of us. That there's a God who forgives, who has grace. Watch for the swift changes of mood between love and anger. Wouldn't you feel that way if you were a husband? And you find God just, just dealing with love and anger, and it's so true to life. A husband or wife whose love has been betrayed might feel this way. Parents might feel this way about a child who keeps going off the rails, and you keep bringing them back, and you keep reaching out, and you keep putting them in rehab, and you keep working at it and working at it and working at it, and they do nothing but keep getting off the rails. How far does grace and love go? And they go back and hit the streets again. Read these verses with me. This is God sharing his heart with all of us, how he feels when his lover, us, you and I, when we reject him, what he's telling us is I'll go as far as I've got to go to get you back. If I have to get mad and I'll just put it this way, little locker room talk and knock the snot out of you, I'll do it. If I have to cry and chase you and hurt and tell you how bad I hurt for you, I'll do it. If I have to have you accidentally turn on a television program and catch some crazy preacher preaching and you keep trying to walk away from the message, I'll do it. I'll do whatever I've got to do to bring you back. Aren't you glad we serve a great God that way? Could you give him praise with me right now that he has that kind of love and affection for us? So what does all of this teach us? When you read through a book like this, Hosea, it's not a long book. Again, I hope most of you read it. I'd like to say I hope all of you read it. Now's the time. This is the kind of stuff that's in the Word of God. When you read through this short book, what does it all teach us? The first thing it teaches us, if you're taking notes, is grace is unmerited. In our tradition, we have a hard time with that. It's unmerited. What that means is she didn't deserve it. Because sometimes we feel like people ought to clean it up before they come to the Lord. And sometimes people feel that way about themselves. I can't serve the Lord. I've got to clean it up first. Let me just tell you, you'll fail every time because you can't clean it up. Only God can. 
She didn't deserve it. Gomer, the wife of Hosea, she didn't deserve what her husband does for her now that she has nothing. I mean, here she is later in life. We, most of us would want to stand back and see, say, see, you got everything you deserved. Your beauty's gone now, pretty lady. Nobody's looking at you now. Her beauty is stripped. Uh, it had, there's no value. All she can do is hope that someone will buy her and allow her to work as a slave hand. And once he had so much to offer, but not now, the woman that could turn a man's head and catch his eye is now worthless when it, came to a, when it comes to a man's desires. She's not turning anybody's head anymore when she walks by. There's no men saying things to each other now who've got lust in their eyes. There's nobody saying anything now because she's not as beautiful as she once was. She's been used and abused. She's washed up. It's over. There's nobody standing in line waiting to pay high dollar now. It's a different day. Nobody really wants her now. The bidding, you read about it, is for half price the common slave. And we could argue she's really got what she had coming and it's the one thing, you know, her husband, he, what, what, he, it's one thing to leave her husband and to go prostitute herself, but my goodness, to leave three children? Who does that? Who walks away from children? You know, I can't relate to that. I thank God for Debbie. That's one thing she never did. She didn't walk away from her children. She's never done anything like that. She's not went and whored around all over the place. I can't imagine such a thing or dealing with such a thing. I don't know how in the world Hosea ever it had to be the grace of God. And I thank God. It all comes to the farthest thing from my imagination. I don't worry about such things. I don't get it. I don't know why people do that, but they do. There's people that do that. Here's the sad reality. We may not do those kind of physical things, but we whore around after false gods all the time. God wants us, wants to be our first love. And we find ourselves whoring around after this and chasing that and looking for fulfillment in life. And we're after this and after that and trying to grab this and trying to grab that, thinking it's going to bring us fulfillment. Let me tell you something. I found it to be so true in my life. It has nothing to do with being a preacher. It has everything to do with just being a common man who needed God. And the only thing that ever brought fulfillment to my life is Jesus Christ. He covers me by his blood. No matter how bad I got, no matter how bad it was, there is a Jesus that washed me clean and he continues to wash me day by day. It's only because of the grace of God. Can we give him praise because it's that way with all of us. It's all of us, all of us, all of us. So she had... So much to offer at one time, but not now. The woman that could turn this head and catch an eye, she finds herself standing on an auction block. The woman that could, was so beautiful, but now she's so abused. It's a different day. No one wants her, and the bidding you read about is for half the price of this common slave. But even, even though she does, doesn't deserve it, Hosea finds himself at the auction block. In my mind's eye, she's walked out on the stage full of shame. No one's whistling. No one's gesturing. She's standing there in her tattered clothes. Nothing but what's on her back. And Hosea is prepared to outbid them all, no matter how far he has to go. Did you get that? No matter how far he has to go. And can you picture this? I've often wondered, did she recognize his voice? Did she possibly recognize his, his voice? When you're reading through chapter 14, it gets heart-rendering because it's there that we see God telling the prophet what he wants Israel to say. He's pleading and telling them, if Israel will only do this, if Israel will only come back to me and accept me when I buy her back, I'd give anything, I'd do anything to have that relationship with my people. In my mind's eye, Hosea, after buying her back, moves to the stage and he helps her down and takes off his coat and wraps her up and walks her to the crowd and there they're walking up the road and God looking down from heaven. This is what chapter 14 tells me. God looking down from heaven and I, I can hear him say, this is what I want to happen to me. 
I want to put my arm around my bride, my people. I want to bless them. I want to forgive them of everything. I want to make it all okay again. But she won't let me. She won't do it. That's what I wish I could do. I want to take my bride home. I want to love her, hold her, say good things to her, bless her, give her favor. She didn't deserve it, no. Neither did she earn it. No, Gomer didn't deserve it and she didn't earn it. The prophets had to raise the children on his own. Children's names whose meanings we find in chapter one were prophetic to the nation of Israel's declension. I mean, it'd be an awful thing to be named, if you've read chapter one, to be named some of those names that those kids got assigned to them. Terrible names, which were prophetic. The lonely nights the prophet had to spend in his bed knowing that his wife was laying all over the community with other men. She didn't deserve this. She didn't deserve, she didn't deserve anything for the rest of her life. Getting up in the morning before he'd have to go to the fields as a single father, he had to provide for his children and no doubt make their meals and dress them and prepare them for the day. And, and, and then when they come in after a long day out in the fields, there's no doubt he was in, worked in agriculture. He had to provide for them, but in the evening he had to give time as a single father to three kids. She didn't deserve it. None of us would cry over or even rebuke him if he wanted nothing to do with her ever again. Listen to me. Grace is unmerited. It's unmerited. The truth is, is not one of us deserve what our loving God has done for us. It's not, nothing less than amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You don't deserve it. You certainly can't earn it. So stop, stop trying to accept, uh, fighting the acceptance of it. You can't earn it. Some of you are sitting here and say, I'm nothing like her. I'm a pretty good person. You really need grace. Not only is grace unmerited, grace is unlimited. You know, the measurement of grace is a, is a unique thing. You see, some of the stories in the Bible are real and raw. I could talk to you about a lot of real, raw stories in the Bible. God, uh, Jesus even picked some pretty real and raw disciples. Did you know that? Guys that didn't have best reputations. They won one amen. They certainly wouldn't have been credentialed in the church of God. I'll tell you that right now. Why did he do that? Here's why I think stories like this are in the scripture. Because if you can't hear how far someone got away from God, we can't measure how far God goes to bring them back. Because many Bible stories are raw and real, we can measure the grace of God. And the same is true with us. Did you know that? That's why testimonies are so important. Lynn Jones, a few weeks ago, sat up here on a stage and made himself vulnerable. I think he's up here in the balcony. There he is in the front row. He went back up there to his old seat, still passing out candy probably. <laughs> Suicidal. Poverty. Bankrupt. Couldn't read or write. Divorce. It's real. And raw. Do you know why that testimony has grabbed our attention? Because we can measure the grace of God and how far God could go to find a bum like Lynn Jones. I'll say it Debbie Page, pastor's daughter, knew better, heard her dad preach all her life. Godly man, holy, raised in a beautiful family, makes a mistake. It's my wife, in case you're visiting. But God's grace found her. And who was Kelvin Page to ever hold that against her when he did some of the same things and just didn't get caught? It's the grace of God. No one deserves 
anything. Some of us just didn't get caught. Dwayne Knight, he shared his testimony publicly. How do you like to have your name splashed all over the front page of the local paper? Lose your medical license because of substance abuse. Oh, pastor, you're talking about such things. It's time to talk about such things because we're not glorifying the bad things. We're glorifying the grace of God. Amen. Remember 17 and a half years ago, meeting Dwayne in lunch, for lunch, General Overseer's son, embarrassed in shame, and he said, I found God in all this. Today, God's brought him back. I love Dwayne Knight. What a godly man. Helped us build a project out in Cuba where alcoholics and drug addicts could get substance abuse help. As far as we knew, it was the only one in Cuba. Isn't the Lord good? I said, isn't the Lord good? He's been good to us. Mike Quayle had dinner with Mike Friday night, traveling a lot. But Mike, how would you like to be the vice president's brother of the United States of America? And suddenly your family has to shut the door behind you in a hotel room and say, it's time to do intervention with you, sir. You are in bad shape. Basically, in a loving way, are saying you're embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing your family. You lost your wife. You are in a mess. You're in a mess. And so we're taking control here. And they begin to assign some things in life. Send to the Betty Ford Clinic and all this, through this whole process, Mike Quayle finds Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Was able to stand up in front of our men and say, God has done a work in my life and I'm set free and I'm serving Jesus. You know, God does that kind of stuff for people. Doesn't matter if you have money, don't have money. Doesn't matter the color of your skin. Doesn't matter how bad you've been or how far you've got out there. What I'm trying to tell you today is Jesus Christ can find you right where you're at and he can set you free and build your life and put it back together again. Come on, church. Let's give him big praise for that. He's worthy to be praised. Please know and understand that the one we must highlight, the one we must highlight in every story, in every story, the one we highlight, as much as I appreciate Lynn Jones and as much as I appreciate my wife, and as much as I appreciate Mike Quayle, and as much as I appreciate all of you who have shared your stories and been vulnerable, the one that I want to praise today is the one who has unlimited grace, who found every one of them, and it all comes back to Jesus because it's unlimited, it's unmarried, unmerited, and it's unmatched. He's that kind of God. Wow, thank you, Lord. Not only is grace unmerited and unlimited, but grace is unmatched. His price is unmatched. Look at the scripture. You read it. You read it in Hosea this week. Finally, the hour arrives and Gomer is brought on the platform. The auction is beginning. Hosea has been silent, waiting for this hour. And there she stands, his bride, so used in abuse, she's hardly recognizable. I already mentioned this, but according to G. Campbell Morgan, half the price of a going slave was paid for her. Half the price of a once beauty. The desire of any man she had no choice, possession now, but everything she, she's, that's happened to her from the human eye and looking through the human lens, she deserves it. And Hosea finds himself at the auction block. She's on the stage full of shame. And she's standing there and the auction starts. Can you hear the auctioneer? What's my bid? What's my bid? Ten. Will anybody go ten? Will anybody go ten for this Slave. It's quiet. Twelve. Certainly she's worth ten. She's really worth twelve. Will anybody go twelve? Perhaps somebody lifts a finger signaling I'll go twelve. She can work. Work like a dog. Twelve. Will anybody go fourteen? Silence. Long silence. 14, won't anybody go 14? Certainly she's worth 14. Silence. And I'm convinced that Hosea was willing to wait till the last bid. It didn't matter how much it was. 
It didn't matter how high it got. He was going to wait to be the last bidder. And he waited and waited. And finally, he's willing to go the price that no one else is willing to pay. And do you understand? That's the God that you serve. He was willing to pay the price for you and I that nothing or no one or no other God or nobody else would ever be willing to pay. He outbid the highest bidder. He's still showing that grace and love to you and he'll go beyond whatever it takes to get you back. Could we give him the biggest praise of the day that that's exactly what he does for you and I? Sold. So, can you picture this? It's prepared and goes up and picks her up, and they walk off together up the road with this coat around her. She's got to take her home to three kids. Who knows if they'll even accept her. Years later, they're much older. Perhaps they're not even home now. But how does he explain all this? The prophet. Uh, thirdly, grace is unexplainable. And I'll wrap this up quickly. Why is it unexplainable in this context? Hosea is a prophet, and I'm going to say this, and I, it's going to create some tension. Don't write me any emails. Just struggle with me. He's a lawbreaker. If you go back and read the law, it's against... Any man of God should not marry a prostitute. I've struggled with this through the years. I think about his reputation that's on the line. This is a prophet. This is a spokesman for God. Can you imagine if you were a counselor, a pastor, and a person who claims to be called by God walks into your office and says, the Lord has spoke to me and I'm going to go marry a prostitute. You probably would run me out of your pulpit for telling him it's okay. He's clearly told in the law that you don't do that. I've struggled with this and I've dug at it and looked at what people far more studied in this particular book than I ever will be, I find that there's a little bit of a common conclusion among them. It's hard to fathom. But for God to love so much, he's willing to break his own laws to get you back. Now you think about that. Did he break his law when he allowed his son to be murdered, thou shalt not murder. And he had the power and control to not allow that to happen. Those are good questions, aren't they? It's okay. Struggle with me with it. Don't just, uh, I know the answer. Stop it. If you'll sit with that, I tell you what I see all over it, and I don't know that I have all the answers. I see a God of such grace that however far he's got to go, he's not willing to let you go. Let me just say it this way. You're going to have to work to send yourself to hell. Oh, pastor, some of you were raised thinking you went to hell every day because you did a little sin. I'm not that insecure in my walk with God. Now, don't you misunderstand what I'm driving at. Oh, he went, he, ooh, that word eternal. He's right there getting close, eternal security. <gasps> no, what I'm telling you is a lot harder than what we've taught it. Now, can God send someone there? Absolutely. Will there be people there? Absolutely. But you just need to understand, and this is not just cute words. The Lord is able to hunt you down like a hound dog, and he won't let go of you. 
And he's going to keep coming back and coming back and coming back. If he's got to make life difficult on you, if he's got to put you in a corner, if he's got to put you in a jail cell to get your attention, whatever he's got to do, he'll take it as far as he needs to take it because he loves you so much. He loves and cares for you so, you say, that's love? Absolutely. For him to intervene and say, hey, I'm not going to allow you to continue to do what you do because it'll take you up a road that you have no idea what's at the end of that road. Listen to us. Most of us have no idea, but there's a God that already sees ahead and he'll do divine intervention if he has to, to get you back. We can give him praise for that. His grace is unexplainable. Let me just put it that way. It's unexplainable. So uh, I got to close this. Look through the lens of Gomer. Would you let's put let's put Gomer's sandals on for a moment? What must that have felt like to be standing there with shame and reproach? knowing that you had messed your whole life up. You're pitiful. Almost worthless. Can't begin to bring the kind of dollar you used to bring. No sweet comments. No men putting words in your ears that are worthless just to get what they want. Standing there in front of the community, shame, no dignity, head down, what's the bid? And see, here's a voice. It's a voice of a husband. And married her and pulled her out of the pit years ago. And had babies with her. Had a family. And whose voice does she hear? But his voice. Put Hosea's sandals on. Shame and reproach, risking the gossip in the community. Prophet, man of God, what kind of idiot would do this? But when it comes time to bid, it's him who lifts his head. Squares his shoulders. Said, I'll take her back. And look through the eyes of God as they walk off the auction block and start walking up the road. And Hosea's arm is around her and he says, I've never stopped loving you. I've never stopped loving you. And God looking down at that and saying, oh, how I wish I could do that with my bride. How I wish I could do that with my bride bride that's the message Hosea God's grace is unmerited God's grace is unthinkable God's grace is unmatched God's grace is unexplainable God's grace goes so far beyond what we can describe imagine or think so we just say, like the old songwriter did, amazing grace. It's amazing grace. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound to hear the voice of the prophet bidding. How sweet it is to hear the whispers of the Lord to say, I want you. I love you. I need you. Would you stand with me, please?